So Ibrahim Raisi, a 60-year-old hardline cleric, was just selected to be Iran's new president. And I think there are three main takeaways here. Number one is that this really was a selection, not an election, and that the vote that counted most was not the vote of the Iranian people, but the vote of Iran's supreme leader, 82-year-old Ayatollah Ali Khamenei, who views in Ibrahim Raisi his potential successor. Takeaway number two is that I think for many Iranians, this selection was a reminder that they're living in a system which really can't be reformed via the ballot box. It's too inflexible to reform, but it's also too brutal to collapse. And I think for many Iranians, they see themselves living on a street which is dead-ended in both directions. It can't reform, nor can it collapse. And for that reason, for many young Iranians in particular, the answer is immigration, to try to go uh, make their lives outside the country. Takeaway number three is that given Ibrahim Raisi's past complicity in terrible human rights abuses, it's going to make it much more difficult for countries that want to engage Iran economically, whether those are countries in the European Union or in Asia, uh, to, to justify their commercial relations with Iran. And at the same time, it's going to make it easier for Iran's adversaries, whether that's governments in Israel or Saudi Arabia, or even the Republican Party in the United States, to try to demonize and isolate Iran, uh, given Raisi's dark background. So I'd say in sum that the selection of Ibrahim Raisi was in many ways a defeat for the people of Iran, but in many ways a victory for the adversaries of Iran. So I think Raisi's selection has two important implications for the United States. Number one, for the Biden administration, there's now a heightened sense of urgency to try to revive the Iran nuclear deal before August 8th, when Raisi's team is inaugurated. It's true, the Supreme Leader and the Revolutionary Guards will continue to call the shots in Iran, but there is a fear that Raisi could bring to power a new group of inexperienced, more inflexible negotiators which could complicate life for the Biden administration. Second, I think it's going to make it that much more difficult for the Biden administration to try to negotiate a follow-on nuclear deal with Iran, which also addresses Iran's regional ambitions and its missile program. So I think in sum for the United States, the selection of Ibrahim Raisi is not fatal to the nuclear deal, but it certainly complicates the nuclear deal's revival. Ayatollah Khamenei has been ruling Iran since 1989, and Ibrahim Raisi is widely perceived to be his preferred choice for supreme leader once Khamenei has died. The reality, though, is that one of the big questions in Iran will be, what does the Revolutionary Guards do? The Revolutionary Guards as an institution have really eclipsed the clergy in terms of their economic and political power. And Iran society has changed a lot. It's much less religious society than it was several decades ago. So I would argue in the coming years and decades, it's perhaps more likely that, that rather than Iran being ruled by another religious cleric, we may see the emergence of an Iranian version of Vladimir Putin, someone who comes from the military and intelligence establishment. And rather than espousing Shiite nationalism, will try to espouse Persian nationalism. So there have been three longtime pillars of Iran's regional policies, which Raisi's election really shouldn't change. Number one is Iran's opposition to the United States and U.S. influence throughout the Middle East. Number two is Iran's rejection of Israel's existence and its support for groups like Hamas and Islamic Jihad. Number three is Iran's rivalry with Saudi Arabia. Now, we won't see any change in US-Iran relations or Iran's opposition to Israel, but we may start to see a slight detente in Iran-Saudi relations, although the two countries will remain very suspicious of one another. Now, the second thing which Raisi's election won't change is Iran's longtime support, funding, and cultivation of regional militias, whether that's Lebanese Hezbollah, Shiite militias in Iraq, uh, 
the Houthis in Yemen, and Iran's continued to support for Bashar Assad in Syria. But I think one thing that Raisi's election does change is uh, how the international community perceives Iran, because under Iran's previous president, Hassan Rouhani, and his foreign minister, Javad Zarif, there was a perception in many parts of the world, whether Asia or Europe, that Iran had moderate politicians who the West and you know, the world could do business with. I think Raisi's election and Raisi's implication in human rights abuses in some ways makes it easier for Iran's regional adversaries, namely Israel and Saudi Arabia, to make the case that uh, Iran is, is not a good faith partner to the West and Iran is a, is a dangerous actor which um, should be isolated and demonized rather than engaged. So what used to make Iranian presidential elections unique by Middle East standards was they were not only unfree and unfair, but they were also unpredictable. And that if you compare Iranian elections to let's say Syrian elections, you didn't necessarily know who the winner was going to be. The same way we know that Bashar Assad would win the Syrian elections by upwards of 95% of the vote. What was different about this presidential election in Iran was that the regime didn't want to take any chances. The preferred candidate of the Supreme Leader was Ibrahim Raisi. They know that Raisi is not someone with a lot of popular support. So they rigged the outcome by essentially only allowing seven pretty unpopular, unappealing candidates to run in order to ensure that Raisi would be declared victor.